Uh, good evening, my, uh, my colleagues, my professors, my, my friends. Today we have a, a night symposium or night webinar, which is now in the virtual webinars of COVID pandemics. This is an international heart failure webinar. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest webinars we are doing in the last two months. Uh, we have two eminent uh, speakers today. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Fausto Pinto, the friend to all of us, to uh, Cardio Alex Ibre Foundation, Egyptian Society of Cardiology, and uh, is a past president of the uh, European Society of Cardiology and now is the president of uh, World Heart Federation. Dr. Fausto, uh, uh, I, I know Dr. Fausto stays a long time. We made a lot of uh, sharing. Uh, uh, projects with each other uh, during when, when I was president of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology and now when I was president of the CBREP Foundation. Uh, the second speaker is also an eminent international speaker, Dr. Jesper Pusani, uh, is a board member of European Heart Failure Associations, is very interesting in doing uh, lectures and uh, heart failure uh, uh, recommendations and heart failure guidelines. Uh, and two of them will have uh, two different topics. One of Dr. Fust is going to give the first topic on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and Dr. Jespo, uh, heart failure with uh, diabetes. And after each lecture, we have uh, questions. Uh, the second uh, talk with the uh, lecture. Then we take a break, and we have the second session. Uh, first speaker is Professor Mahmoud Hassanin, uh, Professor Mahmoud, Professor of Cardiology, Alexander University, is the editor of chief of Egyptian Heart Journal and the past uh, president of the working group of heart failure of the responsible also for the heart failure registry with the European Society of uh, Cardiology. And then the second speaker is Professor Mohammed Selim, the consultant cardiology National Heart Institute and secretary of uh, intervention working group of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. As you can see, we have four uh, 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 eminent speakers. We start by uh, uh, first speaker, then we take just a break, a few seconds, then we shift to the Dr. Fust. Dr. Mahmoud is joining with me in the moderation of the questions and answers for this, uh, uh, the first and second session. Uh, have a break and shift to Dr. Fustu. So good evening, my friends from Egypt, uh, Professor Sobi, Professor Hassanin, uh, Giuseppe, dear colleagues, it's a real pleasure to be in this way with you in, uh, in Egypt. I'm in my home place in, uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. I've been many, many times in Egypt. Actually, my last trip before the whole thing with the COVID was to Egypt. I was at Cardio Egypt uh, in February, and I'm certainly delighted to be here today and uh, discuss with you uh, some of the topics that are very important uh, for our daily practice and uh, that hopefully we can share some ideas and share some information and discuss a little bit around the subject that I was asked to talk about, which is about the some of the diagnostic challenges in patients with heart failure with preserved uh, ejection fraction. So let me just give you um, a typical or not so typical, but uh, a clinical uh, uh, presentation, a very short presentation on uh, one of our patients. It's a 56-year-old uh, male, uh, previous smoker, and he had a previous history of a timoma, and he had surgery when he was 51 years old, so five years ago. And then uh, at that time, he, he underwent uh, radiotherapy, and then he had two recurrences when he was 52 and 54 years old, each time undergoing surgery, and radiotherapy, and in one of the last time, also undergoing chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy with doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. And he's admitted uh, in our hospital in the emergency room with shortness of breath at rest, orthopnea, and uh, at the uh, physical examination is polypneic, is normotensive, tachycardic, uh, with some with rails, uh, bilateral rails, and no peripheral edema. Uh, is given uh, some diuretic IV, some digoxin, and this is uh, the ECG, I hope you can see it, and basically uh, he was in flutter, uh, 
So he was admitted uh, to our unit, and then he had a, a, a caval tricuspidus with ablation, and uh, he was put on, uh, um, and he basically was asymptomatic after uh, the correction of uh, the arrhythmia. At that time, uh, the echo showed basically a structurally normal uh, heart with preserved ejection fraction, and he was uh, discharged. And the, basically, this shows uh, the echo. You can see here preserved ejection fraction. Uh, that's the left ventricle, the left atrium, maybe a little bit dilated, a little bit of mitral regurgitation, but nothing really uh, totally abnormal from an um, imaging standpoint. But uh, a few, a couple of weeks later, he's admitted again in uh, um, shortness of breath, class three New York Heart Association with orthopnea. And at this time, you can see here, he underwent uh, uh, echo doppler, which showed some restrictive pattern. You can see a very short deceleration time, a tall uh, E wave with a very short, uh, uh, a very small A wave. And basically, you can see here also uh, relatively low uh, e prime on the on the tissue doppler with uh, some um, respiratory variation, although it looked a little bit blunted. And he underwent at this time a right and left calf to uh, basically make the differential diagnosis or to rule out uh, constrictive pericarditis. And indeed, the pattern uh, was not showing uh, evidence of constriction. And uh, then he underwent some uh, uh, magnetic resonance, which basically showed a restrictive pattern. And this was interpreted as uh, being a restrictive pattern or restrictive physiology in the setting of chemotherapy and uh, also uh, radiotherapy. So he was put on an AC inhibitor, on a beta blocker, and uh, he went back to class two New York Heart Association. The echo basically showed the same sort of images with the uh, preserved ejection fraction, and the patient uh, was discharged, uh, basically uh, asymptomatic or with very mild, uh, mild symptoms. So an example of a patient who underwent treatment with chemo, radiotherapy, uh, who was admitted with acute heart failure, who had some at the, at, the, at the Empress, at the admission of the second time, he had some evidence of uh, so-called restrictive physiology, but after correction, he basically had a recovery uh, of his clinical condition and he was uh, discharged on a beta blocker and the NACE inhibitor. So this brings us to the uh, definition, the current definition of heart failure. So this patient with the ejection fraction over 50%, would be included in, uh, uh, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And now at the European Society of Cardiology, in the last guidelines, which were published in 2016, there was a third type of heart failure. So the classical two types, the reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction. And then this one called mid-range ejection fraction, which basically includes the patients who have uh, ejection fraction between 40 and 49%. And here you have the diagnostic algorithm on the assessment of these patients with preserved ejection fraction, where you have on one hand here the initial uh, workup, which basically is the pretest assessment, where you have to take into consideration the symptoms, signs of heart failure, some of the comor comorbidities or risk factors, the ECG, do a standard echo, natriuretic peptides, and maybe do a six-minute walking test to test the exercise capacity of the patient. Then the second step on the diagnostic workup is the diagnostic workup, which includes a more comprehensive echo study and the uh, so-called natriuretic peptide, uh, peptide the score. And again, here, the combination of the two will give you already some important diagnostic information. And then moving into the so-called advanced workup, which basically represents a functional testing in case of some uncertainty. And in this case, you may actually do a diastolic stress test by using uh, exercise stress echo, which is becoming more popular in the assessment of diastolic function, particularly in patients with preserved ejection fraction, and eventually do some invasive hemodynamic measurements. And finally, uh, the etiological uh, workup uh, to, uh, to basically reach the final etiology. And here, the use of uh, cardi cardiovascular magnetic resonance, the, the use of cardiac or non-cardiac biopsies, particularly to rule out some, some type of uh, amyloidosis or some uh, uh, diseases that, uh, um, uh, that can uh, uh, do some sort of deposition, uh, then do some scintigraphy or even CT or PET, 
genetic testing and some specific laboratory tests. So basically here you have the four different steps of the so-called diagnostic algorithm in patients with heart failure with preservative gestion fraction and with this there will be a comprehensive assessment of the individual patient. Here you have, a, a, let's say, a, a more uh, easy and simplified algorithm on the assessment of patient who, became, who uh, is admitted with suspected heart failure and then uh, the assessment of, of heart failure probability based on a clinical history, physical examination and ECG and then you can either go straight to the echo, and again here the use of echocardiography is really at the center of the diagnostic procedure in these patients, or uh, you can have an intermediate step uh, with the measurement of nitriuretic peptides if you want to, uh, to go a little bit slower in the assessment. I have to say that in our case, we go straight to the, to the echo, although of course the nitriuretic peptides are also important, particularly for risk stratification. And uh, by using this, you actually have very good information for the individual patient, which may help you to identify the type of heart failure, give you some information also in terms of uh, etiology and so on. Now, let me focus a little bit on imaging and some of uh, uh, the modalities that we use currently to assess patients uh, with heart failure and uh, how much that can help us to assess the severity of the heart failure to assess the functional abnormalities, and even to have some information that can help us to establish the etiology of the heart failure. Now, ECHO is at the center, is really the technique that basically can be brought to the bedside of the patient, can be done even in the outpatient clinic or on the other side in the intensive care unit, and it does provide a lot of information in terms of systolic function, global function, regional function, ventricular remodeling, can assess also contractile reserve, presence of ischemia, viability, particularly if using some sort of stress testing, and also very importantly in patients with heart failure to assess valve function because we know that if there is a volume overload with mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation, that impacts on the ejection fraction and on the way we should be assessing the severity of the heart failure. ECHO also can provide a lot of measurements, and I will not get into all the details, but basically it can provide us uh, uh, dimensions, uh, volumes, mass, cardiac output, TPDT, a lot of hemodynamic information that can be very useful. The use of the biplane Simpsons rule to assess ejection fraction is the gold standard for assessing uh, ejection fraction. And today we also have the use of 3D ECHO and particularly the use of automated 3D echo, which actually was a, a big advancement in terms of having a more objective assessment of left ventricular function and particularly of ejection fraction because the, the use of 3D echo overcomes some of the limitations, particularly geometric assumptions that we have when we use the uh, biplane Simpsons method. Now, another important use of uh, echo, in particular of Doppler flow, is to assess the hemodynamics and to assess diastolic function. So basically, it uh, provides us with information that uh, provides information regarding the difference between left ventricular and left atrial pressures. And this is determined, of course, by looking at mitral inflow. And here we have the three typical patterns of mitral inflow, either the normal flow, impaired relaxation with a, a small E wave, which basically is uh, on the proto-diastolic uh, diastolic part of uh, uh, the, the left ventricular filling with a relatively slow desperation time and then the peak A wave. And then we uh, have here the restrictive pattern with a tall E wave, short desperation time, a small A wave, which is a typical example of a patient with increased left ventricular and diastolic pressure, which can be easily assessed by using this methodology. And we know that these parameters actually have not only diagnostic, but also prognostic information. And here we see that regardless of the duration of the QRS, the presence of a restrictive filling pattern uh, can individualize the patients who have worse outcome in follow-up compared with the patients with a non-restrictive filling pattern. The use of tissue doppler also provides a lot of information regarding myocardial function. And uh, by using this method, we can look at longitudinal, at radial and circumferential function and uh, it provides this kind of uh, uh, very well recognized uh, curves, graphics with systolic component with the E prime and the A prime. And by doing this, we can actually have a relatively good assessment or estimation of filling pressures, particularly by using the ratio of E to E prime, which has been shown many years ago that if it is over 15 
it uh, uh, represents an increased filling pressure. If it's slow, uh, then eight, it represents low uh, filling pressure and diastolic left ventricular pressure. And this is a relatively, um, although with some limitations, but it's a relatively good way to estimate left ventricular filling pressures. And then we have other ways to look at that not only using the E2E prime, but particularly in the gray zone, we can look at the pulmonary venous uh, um, A wave. And uh, we know that uh, if there is a prolonged pulmonary venous A wave during the atrial contraction, if it's longer than the mitral uh, valve, the, the transmitral uh, atrial flow, that means that there is an increased uh, filling pressure. And also by using the valsalva maneuver and to look at the E2A uh, ratio, that can also provide some information. And finally, left atrial size is a good measurement, is a good way to look at diastolic function. And particularly, it's a little bit like the hemoglobin A1C for diabetes. It does provide some information on the chronicity of diastolic dysfunction and increased filling pressures. Then it's very important to make the differential diagnosis of restriction versus constriction. In our patient, you did see that uh, when he was admitted, uh, on the second time with acute heart failure, he had a very small, a very short E prime, although we had uh, actually a, a normal uh, E wave. And this uh, is a good way to differentiate from constriction because in restriction, it's a myocardial problem. So there is an impairment in the E prime, which means that, that, that there is a affection of the myocardial function. While in constriction, which is a pericardial problem, the E prime is preserved. And this is actually a very good way, very nice way to make differential diagnosis. As I've mentioned, looking at the left atrium can provide a lot of information on the chronicity of uh, 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 diastolic dysfunction and particularly on increased filling pressures and also provides some information in terms of uh, prognosis. And here we can see that uh, uh, the relationship between the severity of diastolic dysfunction from normal to moderate to severe diastolic dysfunction and left atrial volume index and the highest left atrial volume index, the highest the correlation with more severe forms of diastolic dysfunction, which is also shown here. This is work done some years ago, which basically showed that patients with diastolic dysfunction grade three or four, a hundred percent of them, they had an increase in they had left atrial enlargement with an increase in left atrial volumes. Now, with the development of myocardial deformation parameters, there was also an improved ability to look at myocardial function. And by using these parameters, we can actually, again, look at longitudinal, radial, and circumferential function. And here, what is provided is a measurement of myocardial deformation. So actually, it provides direct information on myocardial function, and therefore, it overcomes some of the limitations of ejection fraction. Basically, ejection fraction is just looking at volumes and diastolic uh, minus and systolic over diastolic volume. So it's an indirect, a very crude measurement of uh, uh, systolic function. By using this methodology of myocardial deformation, there is a much better way to more objective way to look at myocardial function. And uh, this can be obtained uh, by using uh, tissue, uh, tissue Doppler and looking at uh, uh, tissue velocities and then translate into strain absolute strain, which is the changes in myocardial deformation over the cardiac cycle with thickening and, uh, during systole and lengthening during diastole and strain rate, which is the absolute change in strain at every single time of the cardiac cycle. And these two information can actually provide very important information in terms of uh, uh, myocardial function and systolic function. And here then we have the, the development of 2D strain using speckle. So by using speckle tracking and tracking the speckles, it does provide also uh, information in terms of objective information of uh, uh, myocardial function. This can be displayed also in a color like, uh, like this, and you can see over the cardiac cycle, this is the apex, and you have from the basal to the, to the apical to the lateral, you can actually have a display of uh, uh, myocardial thickening or lengthening during the cardiac cycle. And you can do this globally, or you can look at different separate segments, and then you can have also assessment, not only global assessment, but regional assessment and segmental assessment of the different left ventricle segments. And this came into the definition of this, the so-called global longitudinal strain, which is basically the average of the different segments of the left ventricle. And this global longitudinal uh, strain basically is now what we call the new ejection fraction, or if you mean a new surrogate of systolic function. 
And uh, this uh, is, uh, uh, in a way, a more objective, although, of course, as always, there are some limitations, but it's a more sophisticated way to look at myocardial function, particularly when compared with, uh, uh, with ejection fraction. So it's a more objective way to look at myocardial function. And here we have the evolution from the, uh, the 90s with the development of tissue doper to the current stage where we can do, we went through strain, speckle tracking, 3D left ventricular volumes, 3D strain. So there's been a whole spectrum of evolution in the use of myocardial deformation parameters to look at, uh, at function. And here you can see some of the clinical applications of these speckle tracking uh, uh, studies, which basically do provide some information on, for instance, the differential diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy, which can be very important in the setting of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, because it may be important to differentiate, for instance, or to help to differentiate between athlete's heart, one example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertensive cardiomyopathy, uh, hypertensive heart, so it's another piece of information that can be useful for this differential diagnosis. Now more and more is also being used in the assessment of cardiotoxicity. I will talk a little bit about that. This is becoming more and more relevant because we're seeing more and more patients who undergo some uh, chemo, uh, uh, chemotherapy, like the patient that uh, uh, I presented to you. And this is very important. We have now a cardio-oncology clinic where we, we follow a lot of these patients and longitudinal strain or strain is actually part of the protocol in the assessment of these patients. And here you can see how we can obtain information by using global longitudinal strain, quantification of global and regional left ventricular function, in the coronary disease, the detection of ischemia and so on. So many clinical applications that have been proved to be useful in this setting. Just a few examples. Here, the detection of subclinical left ventricular dysfunction after chest radiation. We do know that uh, uh, this may affect left ventricular function and by using these methods, you can actually have an early detection before there is an impairment in left ventricular ejection fraction. This is a study done a, a couple of years ago by the group of Tom Marwick in uh, Australia. They used speckle tracking to assess the left ventricular responses in uh, patients who uh, were undergoing cardiotoxic uh, chemotherapy and they did some kind of protection. So basically what they did, they did strain imaging. If the patient had a deterioration in global strain more than 11%, they divided in two groups of patients. One started with beta blocker and the other followed up. And then there was a difference with an improvement in function in the patients who underwent uh, the group with the beta blocker compared with the group that was treated conventionally. So by <clears throat> using this, uh, methodology is one way to follow these patients, and they concluded that the use of this global longitudinal strain is an effective parameter to identify systolic dysfunction and responses to cardiac protection. And there have been other studies, we are involved in a few studies now, and we're actually using this in our clinical practice in, the, in our cardio-oncology clinic. One important aspect that I've, uh, I've shown you is also the use of stress imaging, and particularly diastolic stress test, because we do know that in some cases, uh, we what we have is that uh, patients with uh, um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which you have here, if they are stressed, you see that the, if you look at the E2E prime, for instance, there is no significant difference between the rest and exercise, while in the, in the in normal controls, you can see that the uh, global longitudinal strain is actually uh, uh, increased in, at the baseline, and then with exercise, there is kind of a recruitment of function with an increase in global longitudinal strain uh, when uh, when the patient is exercised, which it's not seen uh, in the patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And this can also be shown, uh, that's what I was mentioning, uh, another study that showed that doing at the same time e 2 prime, you can actually see an increase in e 2 prime showing that there is an increasing filling pattern the pressure that goes together with uh, the impairment in global longitudinal strain. Now, other methods of imaging have been very useful, like uh, cardio cardiac magnetic resonance. And I just show you a few examples because uh, cardi cardiomagnetic resonance, uh, it's a much better spatial resolution, and now it's considered the gold standard to look at the left ventricular function. Of course, it has uh, uh, some more requirements in terms of training and uh, uh, to be used uh, on, a, on a daily basis, but it's becoming very important also for perfusion studies. Here you can see one of our uh, uh, patients that by using a 3-Tesla, we could demonstrate the subendocardial 
uh, perfusion defect, which you can see here. And also, uh, this is a very well-known figure, which basically by using this uh, um, uh, magnetic resonance and using late gadolinium enhancement, you can actually differentiate between the ischemic and non-ischemic patterns of uh, uh, left of uh, uh, so-called cardiomyopathy, although uh, in this case it's mostly patients with impaired um, function, but in some circumstances, even with preserved ejection fraction, like patients with Fabry or with sarcoidosis or with some other forms with amyloidosis, it can be very useful for this differential diagnosis. And here we do have some examples, for instance, on the use of uh, the amount of iron in uh, hemosiderosis or hemochromatosis, which can be also used by uh, this technique to assess and, and is very much multifaceted uh, role of cardiomagnetic resonance in, uh, in patients uh, with heart failure, and also an important application, and this is one of our cases, is to help it's the patient who underwent CRT, but uh, uh, so this was a patient with impaired systolic function, but anyhow, just to show you that CMR can be very useful to help to guide where to place the, uh, uh, the, uh, the electrodes for resynchronization, and you can see here the areas of fibrosis, which we know that are areas that if they are the ones where we, we, we put uh, the wire, they are not so well in terms of response than the, the other segments. So it's important to guide the therapy. So just the final word on treatment. As we know, it's been one of the big challenges uh, to um, um, develop treatment strategies for these patients with preserved ejection fraction. You have here over time different studies with the digoxin, the DHPF, the charm preserve, with the desertan, uh, the Pepsi AGF, the Valley, the I preserve, and so on. And now the, the latest is the Paragon, which uh, with the combination of uh, Sacubitril and the uh, Valsartan. And here, just to show the results, this was presented uh, uh, last year and basically showed the 13% reduction. It was borderline in terms of statistical significance, and there was a 30% reduction on primary uh, endpoint in the treatment group compared with the, uh, the control group, which was on uh, Valsartan. So it did not reach a statistical significance, but there was a trend towards improvement in the treatment group. And here uh, you can see here 15% reduction, again, borderline for statistical significance for heart failure hospitalizations. And then when looking at some specific secondary endpoints, you can see that uh, here it reached statistical significance, some of the assessments in terms of functional classification or some scores that get that assess quality of life, that there was an improvement in the in the group um, of sacubitril Valsartan, which you can see here. And, uh, and again, looking at some adverse events, uh, there was a slight increase in terms of hypertension or uh, elevated uh, potassium. Uh, but very importantly, when doing some subgroup analysis, the female white with the ejection fraction less uh, medium, medially uh, impaired, these patients did better compared uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the control group. And here you can see basically um, in, uh, in, in the cell group of women, there was actually clinical significance when looking at the uh, difference between the, the treated group with the combination of sacubitril and the Vosarta with the group treated with Vosarta. So maybe leaving here some room still for some uh, research and maybe um, some sort of a hope that there will be some other ways to try to improve these uh, patients from a medical perspective. And so women and left ventricular ejection fraction less than 57% was kind of uh, the, uh, um, the subgroups that did well uh, with the, uh, in the treatment group. So to summarize, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is still a challenge. It's very important and the cardiovascular imaging play a central role in the diagnosis, in guiding the treatment of these patients, echo is certainly the imaging method at the the, the, the forefront of uh, the forefront of uh, uh, the uh, the diagnostic tools that we have available to assess these patients. However, other modalities can be complementary, particularly the use of cardiomagnetic resonance. Treatment is still a challenge, but uh, there are some hopes and uh, uh, some uh, ongoing uh, studies. Uh, we did see a little bit of the results that can uh, uh, help to uh, maybe some of the subgroups may benefit from some uh, uh, strategies, but certainly this is one area where a lot of research still needs to be done. And with this, I will finish. And again, I really thank you so much.
for your attention and I'll be more than happy now to answer uh, any questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? My mood, but okay. Thank you, thank you, uh, Fusto, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, this first life of my life to this all this imaging in heart failure preserved projection fraction. Now, I think uh, we, we you, uh, you have in your lecture what's known as the ventricular uh, remodeling. You have to estimate the the global, uh, regional, and ventricular remodeling. Can you explain again the ventricular remodeling criteria you measured in uh, in uh, in diagnostic remodeling, yeah, that, how to get the remodeling. And, and that's a little bit the beauty of using imaging and particularly using echo or, or MRI, CMR, because you can actually have a, an assessment in terms of the dimensions, the thickness, and then do the follow up of uh, these patients. And you, you can, and this has been used also in some clinical trials where you can see what is the impact or what is the evolution over time, for instance, of left ventricular and diastolic volume or as end systolic volume or left ventricular mass and uh, and compare that uh, with uh, with the clinical results uh, that was done for instance in the shift trial and some other trials where you can compare the the differences that were observed from a clinical standpoint and how much those differences translated for instance into ventricular remodeling for in terms of improving uh, uh, volumes or improving mass or improving function. So by doing these measurements, you can actually have a very good objective way to assess ventricular remodeling and again, do the matching or not with the, uh, with the evolution of uh, the clinical condition. And you can do that either on a population or you can do that on an individual patient. It's also done in hypertensive uh, patients, you know, looking at uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, and left ventricular dimensions and see with the impact of the treatment and the control of hypertension, how much that impacts, for instance, in reducing left ventricular hypertrophy and even improving uh, um, volumes, particularly patients with hypertensive heart disease already start to have some sort of uh, uh, also impaired systolic function. And you can monitor that with the use of ECHO or the use of CMR by doing all these measurements. So it's, it can be very useful and it's also been used in clinical investigation, again, to make this correlation between the changes in ventricular remodeling and the clinical observation uh, in the patient uh, population that is being studied. In, in, in preserved ejection fraction, the left ventricle is spared. Uh, so what about the left atrium itself, the left atrial function? Do you think that we are in need nowadays to have something that left atrial function in the echo to uh, restrict how to prove your, uh, in relation to uh, uh, pro-PMP and uh, neotheritic peptides. This is a crucial point. We don't touch it in, in usually concentrate in uh, uh, relaxation, miniature relaxation, and then we go uh, by the echo, speckle crackling, and then cardiac MRI. But we don't concentrate in, except in the volume. We, do, we can, we're not concentrated on the function. It's, yeah, you, you are right. Um, and one of the reasons is because it's more difficult, although there are some studies, I, I didn't get into that because of time uh, constraints, but there are some studies sh looking at atrial strain, and that can be done, and we've, we've, we've been doing that. Also. But it's more difficult to do. And, uh, uh, and uh, it's not as well standardized as uh, left ventricular uh, strain. But that can be done. But you're right, you know, it's less than uh, left atrial function, um, acute uh, measure, objective measurements of uh, um, atrial function is less than, than left ventricular. And I think one of the reasons is because it's more difficult uh, to do it and, and, and more difficult to have reproducible uh, methods. On the other hand, you can have indirect assessment of left or right atrial function by using some of uh, uh, the, the variables that we can do by studying left atrial uh, by, by, by using uh, uh, Doppler flow uh, or indirectly see the, uh, the, what it um, uh, impacts in terms of left ventricular um, um, left atrial volume index, uh, which is uh, one of the measurements that we also use, as I've shown, for diagnosis and also for uh, for prognosis. But in terms of uh, 
assessing uh, atrial function, that's still one area which there's already some data and some studies and softwares that are applied to the, to the atria, but it's more difficult to do and that's probably why it's not standardized yet and it's not done on a routine basis. Well, uh, Dr. Pinto, thank you for this uh, excellent presentation of a case of heart failure with preserved uh, I assume this is chemotherapy induced heart failure, okay? Uh, 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 when did the patient finish his chemotherapy? I, I mean, when did he develop uh, his heart failure? After, after how many years, after the end of his chemotherapy, did he develop this uh, uh, state of heart failure? Well, our impression was that this was an accumulation of uh, radio and chemotherapy. And uh -huh. the, the last treatment was about one year before, so it was not during the chemotherapy. And that's why it probably was a combination of, of both uh, um, uh, the, um, and maybe also because we know that many times there is some sort of uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, etiology and uh, it's kind of multifactorial. We do see also in patients undergoing a treatment with a, a cardiotoxic medication, some acute changes in terms of impairment in function, subclinical, so patients who still have preserved ejection fraction, who are asymptomatic, but to have a drop in global longitudinal strain. And this is actually one of the areas where there is a, um, there are some guidelines in terms of uh, uh, thresholds, uh, but is one area which is still uh, also under clinical investigation to see what is the, because of course, it's a big decision, you know, a woman who's taking a, a chemo, a chemotherapy for breast cancer, uh, and to decide to, to withhold the, the, the treatment for some time to allow recovery of life ventricular function is, is a big decision. So there are some thresholds uh, that have been uh, defined, but there's also ongoing investigation trying to find the best parameters. Some people also use some biomarkers like troponin to assess uh, the impact in terms of life ventricular function and myo because basically we talked about myocardial injury secondary to the chemotherapy that is done uh, to these patients. Um, but uh, this is one area where the use of equity of imaging can, can be useful. Uh, we use the 15% the drop in the uh, global longitudinal strain, and usually this is a decision that is taken between the cardiologist, the oncologist, and the patient, because of course you have to weight the pros and cons, the, the, the risk benefit of, for instance, having to stop the medication for, for some time. But uh, this is one important aspect that now is being more and more used uh, in the assessment of patients undergoing chemo, uh, chemotherapy. You know, I am happy that you mentioned the constrictive pericarditis in the differential diagnosis of this patient because it, it, it looks similar to restricted cardiomyopathy. Don't you think that cardiac CT would help uh, solve this problem besides uh, uh, tissue, tissue Doppler? Uh, well, cardiac CT basically would show uh, the presence or absence of calcification, of thickening of the, the, the pericardium. Um, so certainly it could add a little bit of information. In our experience, we um, and I think that the use of echo here, and, um, and maybe the use of uh, cardiac resonance also helped a little bit, but particularly the use of echo and echo Doppler and tissue Doppler does provide also some uh, hemodynamic information. Um, and I think that's very important because basically that provides the hemodynamic uh, information that can help you to make this differential diagnosis. And also some parameters like I've shown you the E2B prime, for instance, that can, I would say, with a good sensitivity and specificity to allow you to make this differential diagnosis between a myocardial problem, which is a restriction, versus a pericardial problem, which is a constriction. So, we rely very much on the echo. We're very trained at uh, looking at that. But of course, the use of CT, particularly if it's, for instance, uh, tubercul uh, uh, and uh, we still have some tuberculosis here in, the, uh, in my country, and we do see every couple of cases of constricted pericarditis due to tuberculosis. Um, uh, sometimes you can even see on the chest x-ray, you don't even need a CT. Uh, but with CT, you can have, I would say, a more accurate look at the, at the pericardium. But I would say that with a good echo, you have basically all the information you need. If you want to confirm, then uh, you can do an invasive cath. We rarely do it. We did in this case, but we rarely do it because we trust very much, unless there is some 
you know, question. And of course, in this case, you have to use as much as possible information that you can. And those are the cases where we do uh, also some invasive measurements. But I think echo Doppler with tissue Doppler and with uh, flow Doppler, it's, uh, uh, I would say, an excellent tool with very good sensitivity and specificity to look at the hemodynamics of constriction versus uh, uh, re uh, restriction. Okay. I have questions uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, just uh, I received a WhatsApp from Dr. Basma. is a, a lecturer of cardiology in our department. You know, uh, uh, we are starting to have a cardio-oncology uh, clinic nowadays, and we have a research, and we found a drop in GL. Yeah, as you said before, so I think we are in the track, as uh, Vasma said, that uh, already we have this in 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 uh, in, uh, in those patients. So thank you very much that you confirm what you are doing. We have a question here in uh, in in your routine there for a patient with the cardiotoxicity, uh, patient on chemotherapy. You advise in all these patients to go into speckled crackling, echocardiogram, or cardiac MRI. Well, we do all of them. We do speckled tracking. Mm. Um, we don't do cardiac MRI, but that's also because of just local logistics. We don't do in every single patient. We do in every single patient uh, speckle tracking. We don't do in every single patient cardiac MRI. Uh, we do in only specific situations if we want to have more information. But speckle tracking now it's a routine we do in every single patient. Another, what's your treatment for amyloidosis? Uh, the patient, do you think that with a new treatment, you heard about the very expensive new treatment for amyloidosis nowadays? Do you use for this or just to uh, use uh, the anti failure measures for a patient with preserved ejection fraction of amyloidosis? Well, amyloidosis is, is, is a different, completely different topic. We have now drugs like Tafimidis and some other uh, drugs which are uh, uh, targeting the etiology of uh, amyloidosis uh, depending on the on the type of uh, amyloidosis and we are using, we were involved in a couple of trials and now we are using, if there is an evidence, for instance, of the wild type of uh, amyloidosis, in those cases, then uh, we are using, particularly in the early stages, uh, tafamidis. And, um, and this is actually, um, in our case, we have a special clinic for following up amyloidosis and paramyloidosis. We have a specific type in, the, in, in Portugal of paramyloidosis um, some of these patients even underwent liver transplantation, and uh, we, we have in our clinic, we follow, we have probably one of the largest series uh, in these patients, and we are using some of these medications, we are trying some of them, some, as you know, they're trying to change the, the even getting into the RNA, they're trying to modulate uh, the protein to try to, in, in a way, to do some sort of uh, uh, replacement therapy that can, uh, um, in some cases, potentially can even cure the disease. And as you know, this is a big area of uh, clinical investigation at the moment, already with some relevant clinical uh, results. And uh, and this certainly is one area where we will be able, uh, now we, um, because of there is treatment, um, there is more diagnosis. So people are looking for amyloidosis in, uh, um, when you see um, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, particularly if it's in certain subtypes of patients. And this is one big area now of uh, development of clinical investigation and potentially clinical implications because potentially you may even be able to cure some of these patients. You, on, on your uh, last slide for the trials, you have two uh, last trials, which the DAPA and the Paragon. Are you using these trials nowadays for uh, treatment? I mean, you can use uh, Entresto in such kind of patients in women, for example, if preserved and those with mid range, or uh, are you still waiting? And the same for DAPA. Hmm. Well, it's uh, it's still, an, I would say, uh, as you know, it's not in the guidelines uh, yet for this specific uh, subgroup. Uh, if you use it, and we do use it sometimes, it's an off label use. So it's not, at the moment, it's not a full clinical indication. So if we use it and if the patient is symptomatic and if you, particularly in women, we're starting to use it now, but more on the off-label use. Um, I do I do have excellent results with Entresto and uh, uh, of course, particularly in patients with uh, uh, impaired ejection fraction, but we're starting to use in some subgroups of patients uh, in an off-label uh, use. And as you know, there's some ongoing studies trying to, uh, particularly in the mid-range group, uh, because that seems to be the group that may benefit also. Um, the subgroup analysis in Paragon did show that if you have uh, uh, in that mid-range, probably 
they may benefit. But it's still an off-label use because we don't have yet uh, enough evidence to support that. Another they question yeah. about, uh, do you have, uh, in your practice, do you support your diagnosis of uh, heart failure with uh, preservation fraction by using calculated uh, PCWP by echo, uh, promoting metabolic capillary wedge pressure by the echo? Yeah, well, what we do by using the E2E prime, it gives you some um, information in terms of left ventricular filling pressures. And we do mm -hmm. use that, yes, because that's a measurement of uh, filling pressure and that can actually provide you some information on how you are unloading uh, the uh, left atrium and the, and the left ventricle. And that can actually be useful, uh, even on, on the clinic, uh, it can be useful to see how much you are impacting in terms of improving left ventricular uh, filling pressure. So we, we do, if you do a full study, you will have some sort of information that can help you to okay. uh, modulate the treatment. Okay, question again, beta blockers as a prophylaxis before chemotherapy. Do you use it? I sh yes, we do use uh, beta blockers. Uh, I did show you one study and there have been a few other studies that have shown, particularly in those patients who start to show some decline in uh, um, in in the longitudinal strain, that they seem to uh, improve, and we, if there is no contraindication, we are using more and more beta blockers in these patients. Yes. Dr. Mahmoud, any questions or comment? Mm. Uh, oh well, there are two uh, scoring systems for diagnosis of heart failure preserved ejection fraction. One one was by was uh, you know already a trial published in the circulation. In uh, 18, it, it looks much simpler than uh, the diagnostic algorithm of uh, HFA. What do you think, uh, Dr. Pinto? Well, you, you should use the one you feel more comfortable with. You know, as you know, there are many, and we are very good at uh, developing different algorithms. You should try to use the one uh, you feel comfortable. Basically, for assessing these patients, you will need imaging, you will need the uh, some sort of biomarkers and clinical assessment. So it's this combination that uh, will make you, um, uh, will, will provide you with the data to help you to establish and monitor the treatment of these patients. But this is still one area, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, where there's still a lot of open questions. Also because the phenotype of uh, heart failure with, ejection, with preserved ejection fraction is very wide. We're not, we're not talking about a single entity. We're talking about different entities which mm -hmm. present with similar uh, morphological, in some cases, morphological or phenotyp uh, uh, phenotypic appearance. But that's probably one of the reasons why many trials fail, because we are putting in the same bag different conditions. And, uh, and that's where the challenge is, you know, how we will be able, by using either imaging, biomarkers, to help to, uh, to, to be more uh, tailor-made, if you will, to be more precise uh, in the way that uh, we will manage the individual patient. And that's the big challenge for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, because the data we have so far is very much mixed and sometimes difficult to, to uh, translate for, for a population. Uh, so you, you have to try to be more as, as, as specific as po or tailor-made as possible to the individual patient. And that's where the use of imaging and biomarkers on top of clinical uh, assessment can be useful for the um, uh, for the management of the individual patient. As doctors, that's what we do all the time. Uh, another question: Can we use uh, uh, big E or plus over small E to evaluate left ventricular diastolic failure in the presence of mitral valve disease? Well, uh, there are some limitations on the E to E prime. One of them is calcification. Um, of the annulus. We know that uh, in this case um, it's a limitation if there is very much calcified the annulus. is probably one of the biggest limitations. The presence of valve disease per se, if it's not too calcified, uh, the annulus is, is not, um, the, the, the impact is not major because basically what it shows is the motion of uh, uh, the annulus. Uh, that's where you get the information for, uh, for the E-prime. So um, the only thing you have to take into account is if you have significant mitral regurgitation, means that you have volume overload, and so you have um, loading conditions different. So it's load dependent. Uh, so you have to take into account that E prime is load dependent. So you have when you were assessing and using that information, you, you have to understand that loading conditions 
can actually affect the E-prime. You can see that very nicely on hemodialysis patients before and after dialysis. You can actually have a totally different uh, uh, parameters uh, before and after depending on the loading conditions. If you know that and if you integrate that information, then can be useful. But you have to know the condition of the patient um, to also help you to interpret the results that uh, you are having. As many times, you know, in, uh, uh, in medicine, there is no single parameter, there is no magic uh, number. You have to integrate the whole picture uh, to, at the end, take your conclusions. Thank you, Pisto, very, very much for this wonderful lecture and the interactive discussion. I think we, uh, this is an important topic nowadays. Thank you, Mahmoud Hassan, who chose this, this topic during preparation of the meetings, uh, but you made it uh, successfully. I think it is uh, the master class uh, lecture for uh, all the types of imaging, uh, if you collect this for uh, present projection. Thank you very much, Fustu, again, and uh, looking for the next speaker, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, can yes. Okay. And, uh, just just well, 30 seconds, and then we should... Okay. Okay. Uh. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Mahmoud Hassanin, Professor of Cardiology at Alexandria University. I'm happy to share in this, uh, participate in this uh, excellent meeting, heart failure meeting. And I am honored to introduce Professor Giuseppe Rosano. Uh, Professor Rosano is uh, an executive uh, committee member of the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology. His talk will be about diabetes and heart failure. You know, this is a very common combination, diabetes and heart failure. In our Egyptian registry of heart failure, the prevalence of diabetes was about 45% of patients uh, admitted with the decompensated heart failure had diabetes mellitus. And the ratio was even higher in women, 48%. 48% of Egyptian women hospitalized with heart failure had diabetes. So this is a common combination and we face many problems in the management of this patient. So I'm uh, very eager to listen to Professor Rosano. Professor Rosano. Um, Professor Sanain, uh, Professor Sobi, uh, dear Fausto, it was a great talk, by the way. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. And what I'll do in the uh, next 20 minutes, I will uh, introduce a case on uh, uh, of a patient who is uh, diabetic and then i will get into uh, the main issues that we face when we treat diabetic patients and possibly in the future non-diabetic patients with heart failure so this is a 62 year old man that was has been discharged from a hospital uh, two weeks ago he was at shortness of breath for 500 meters uh, or 12 stairs he had a an ischemic cause of his uh, heart failure at uh, non-insulin dependent uh, diabetes and uh, COPD. Uh, he came because he was uh, becoming uh, breathless. Uh, on examination, heart rate was 70, blood pressure 104 over 60, no pulmonary rails, no edema. And the investigations uh, uh, basically showed normal hemoglobin, uh, slightly reduced EGFR, normal iron stores, and uh, uh, his HbA1c was uh, a target for our colleagues, diabetologist. For us, it was a bit too tight. Uh, he was on uh, furosemide, enalapril, bisoprolol, metformin, 500 milligrams VED, cetagliptin, isosorbide mononitrate. Now, and that was assessed as a good medical therapy. But was that really a good medical therapy after an admission with fluid overload? I mean, this was a patient that was on an alapril BD and uh, the ready uh, in uh, um, had an episode of decompensation. So probably this was a patient that was uh, already should have been on uh, Securitil Valsartan. He had been readmitted three months later with cardiogenic shock and he dies four days into admission. So the issue is, uh, first of all, regarding his diabetes, was that adequately controlled, but also was he on good medical therapy for heart failure? Now, first of all, I mean, should that patient have been prescribed an MRA? And 
uh, I think that that was the. I mean, it should uh, it should have been prescribed because it's. Uh, you see that uh, we we know very well that the MRAs reduced by thirty percent mortality in patients with uh, heart failure. But also, what would you have done? Would you have added dapagliflozin? Would you have added sacubitril valsartan, or both of them, or would you have done other changes? Now. I will give you. Uh, I will get now more into the diabetes, and we will see that things are more complex than the one we think. Of course, there is a clear association between diabetes mellitus and the occurrence of heart failure. Patients with diabetes have a significantly greater occurrence of heart failure compared to patients without diabetes. But and also there is a correlation between glycated hemoglobin and the occurrence of heart failure. However, in patients with heart failure, we can see that uh, uh, glycated hemoglobin or glucose levels have different importance at different age. They are far more important in younger patients, in those with less than 55 years, where you can see that increasing levels of uh, uh, glucose or glycated hemoglobin both in male and females, are associated with a worse prognosis. But no, we don't have such of an evidence in patients with uh, um, who are older than 74 years, where basically there's no increase in uh, mortality or morbidity with increased uh, glucose levels. And also, there's the issue of uh, how strict glucose control should be in patients in, uh, with heart failure and diabetes, but more in general, in patients with cardiovascular disease and uh, diabetes. And because we know that from all the different trials that have been conducted with uh, uh, glucose-lowering agents that uh, intensive and aggressive control of glucose is associated with uh, worse prognosis. All, all of the studies showed and were consistent in showing an increased risk, and that risk seems to be associated to the risk of inducing hypoglycemia. In fact, you see patients who show hypoglycemia during the treatment for diabetes have a fourfold increased risk of mortality and morbidity. And uh, the severe, uh, severe hypoglycemia is always as uh, strongly associated with an increased risk of adverse outcomes. So. The first point we need to make is what is the sweet spot for the treatment of diabetes in patients with heart failure? And unlike the targets of our colleagues, the hepatologists, uh, we should be more relaxed and uh, give, a, say, a target of glycated hemoglobin between 7.5 and 8 as the ideal target for patients with heart failure. This is extremely important because uh, as the heart failure advances, we have a more ketosis-prone state and we need higher glucose levels in order to produce energy. And indeed, if we look at the recent trials with, uh, for example, SGLT, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, in this case, empagliflozin, or with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, liraglutide, both of them reduced mortality and morbidity, and yet the, tag, the uh, glycated hemoglobin at the end of the study in both of them was 7.8%. So something that our colleagues, kind of call, uh, diabetologists, would, would call as uh, less than appropriate, but you can see that with these levels, there was a re reduction in mortality. So the heart failure guidelines the, uh, of the European Society of, um, of Cardiology uh, first tell, tell us that first, patients who have not been treated with, uh, with, uh, for diabetes and who have heart failure and higher hemoglobin, uh, glycated hemoglobin is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events. But once patients have both diabetes and heart failure, the treatment of diabetes should not be very strict. The guidelines, they go, they, go, they go even farther. They say that in patients with diabetes and heart failure, the glycemic control should be implemented gradually and moderately. 
giving preference to intervention have been shown to, to be safe and effective, but also, and uh, what the HFA guidelines highlight, is that they should be directed by the heart failure team. So the heart failure team should be responsible always for the implementation of anti-glycemic medications. And this is because in the past, several uh, cardiovascular drugs like glitazones, but also sulfonylureas have been shown to increase the risk of mortality. And especially after the rosiglitazone case, the a drug that increased uh, mortality and morbidity in patients with uh, diabetes, there's been uh, uh, the uh, European Medicines Agency and the FDA have requested for any new glucose lowering agent the need of a mortality morbidity study. And therefore, in the past few years, we have seen a, flor a blossoming of uh, trials with all the new agents. And the main, three main classes of agents that we, we have that came on the market were, are the SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and the DPP-4 uh, inhibitors. Now, all of them have uh, differences, and we will see how they impact cardiovascular events. First of all, regarding uh, the uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, we have to say they are drugs that are pretty expensive. They have a limited uh, effect on glucose. They have no effect whatsoever on cardiovascular events. And if anything, some of them, especially um, uh, uh, shown the, by the SAVOR, SAVOR TIMI 53 study, some of them may increase the risk of heart failure. And uh, this became evident with the, as, uh, the, as I said, in the SAVOR trial, where saglitin was associated with a 27% risk of heart failure. But in a meta-analysis that uh, uh, my group conducted, we have shown that that is uh, something that is uh, um, uh, uh, consistent across uh, all the different uh, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, maybe not not so much so for citagliptin. And we looked at the uh, a very large uh, data of a reg in a, uh, of the Italian drug, um, drug agency of more than of, of more than one hundred twenty seven thousand patients, where we found that uh, in any case the DPP-4 inhibitors are for sure. Uh, less dangerous than the sulfonylureas and uh, the TZDs. The other group of um, uh, drugs that came uh, on the market are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And as you can see, they are completely different from the DPP-4 inhibitors and also in their results because studies with uh, uh, liraglutide, semaglutide, uh, abiglutide, uh, dolaglutide, all of them, showed a reduction in cardiovascular events. Most of this reduction was mostly in patients with uh, for ischemic uh, um, events, not much, so much so for heart failure. However, the LEADER trial suggested that liraglutide could have had an effect in reducing heart failure. But when tested in, uh, in, a, in a small trial in patients with acute heart failure, it uh, liraglutide show to be associated with a uh, with an increased risk of events and future hospitalizations compared to placebo so it seems that they may reduce the glp1 receptor agonists may reduce macrovascular events but in a, a heart failure probably they have no uh, space and uh, they not, do not reduce events the big difference came with the G, uh, sglt2 inhibitors this year, the three trial with uh, empagliflozin, with canagliflozin, and tapagliflozin, all of them uh, conducted in different patient populations. All of them showed reduction of events. But what is important is that all of them, they showed a reduction in hospitalizations for heart failure that was pretty much similar. There's been a lot of discussion on whether there was a moral reduction in mortality in one study compared to another, whether one study showed a reduction in cardiovascular mortality, the other in overall mortality. But the reality is that they were looking at different patient profiles. 
the MPREG was looking more at patients with established disease, and the CANVAS included 75% of patients with established disease, and the, the dapagliflozin study included patients where, which were largely uh, in the prevention area. But when we look, when you look at the uh, the similar patient profile, so established absolute cardiovascular risk, or you can see that the uh, the three drugs have a similar effect on hospitalizations for heart failure, on the occurrence of major cardiovascular events. So basically, we had evidence from early studies, from the studies in diabetes, patients with diabetes who had not uh, already, uh, they, they did not have heart failure, that uh, this drug may reduce the occurrence of heart failure. Now the question raises whether are these drugs also effective in reducing events in patients with heart failure? And uh, the DAPHF study basically that compared the uh, dapagliflozin to, pl or to placebo in patients with uh, heart failure and reduced ejection fraction with class near class two to four and reduce ejection fraction below 40% and on uh, optimal medical therapy. And the study uh, demonstrated that um, the uh, 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 one important point was that in patients with uh, diabetes, but also in a large proportion of patients without diabetes, because 55% of the of patients included in uh, DAPHF were non-diabetics. Basically, it showed that dapagliflozin was uh, effective in reducing mortality and hospitalizations for heart failure. So it's an impressive result, 25% reduction in the primary endpoint. So, and uh, if you look at the reduction in events, there was a 30% reduction in worsening of heart failure, is impressive and 18% reduction in cardiovascular death. So basically, uh, 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 what did the DAPHF told us is that this is a very effective uh, treatment for patients with, uh, and for patients without diabetes who do have a confirmed diagnosis for heart failure. Now, after the publication of the DAPHF studies, a lot of different hypotheses have been postulated to explain why the SGLT2 inhibitors may improve survival. Probably there is a, not just a one single explanation, is uh, most probably is the combination of all these uh, different effects that may have an effect, uh, that may concur in reducing mortality and morbidity. So first of, first of all is the reduced sympathetic activity that is consequent to reducing insulin fluctuations, the reduction in RASI activation, an improvement in the ventricular loading conditions because we know that they, are, uh, they also have a diuretic effect and can be very significant in uh, uh, many patients, and an improvement in cardiac metabolism and bioenergetics. This is important because it basically showed that the SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to modulate cardiac metabolism, uh, blocking the free fatty acid oxidation and favoring the utilization of glucose and thereby increasing the contractility. Of course, we have um, other trials that with other drugs came along and showed a benefit in patients with and without diabetes. And when we look at the the sacubitril valsartan, we see that there was a similar reduction in death from cardiovascular causes with sacubitril valsartan compared to enalapril and a 20% 20 risk reduction of hospitalizations for heart failure. But what was in uh, came and be of a, um, uh, of a surprise was the fact that uh, sacubitril valsartan was effective in improving glucose control in patients with heart failure. So maybe not as much as uh, um, uh, dapagliflozin, but you see that the effect was uh, significant. It was 0.3% uh, 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 of glycated hemoglobin at the end of the trial, which is uh, an important effect. So it seems that the effect of succubitril valsartan shouldn't be limited, are not limited ju just to the 
effect and modulation of uh, uh, the army, but it's also an effect on uh, uh, metabolism. So at the end, uh, the diabetes mellitus increases the risk of heart failure. In patients with diabetes and heart failure, have a worse prognosis compared to non-diabetic patients. And uh, the different populations and different endpoints chosen by the different studies in patients with diabetes may explain some differences between the study, the prevention studies with empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and uh, dapagliflozin. The only data that we have in heart failure with the anti-glycemic uh, uh, drugs come from DAPHF with dapagliflozin that has been shown to improve mortality and hospitalizations for heart failure in diabetic and non-diabetic patients with heart failure, so, uh, uh, suggesting that probably we should be repositioning this drug as a cardiovascular drug. But also, we, we don't have to forget that other cardiovascular drugs, like sacubitril and valsartan, have been shown to have an effect, an effect on, cardio, on metabolism in patients with diabetes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Rosano, for this uh, excellent case of diabetes and heart failure. And as we see, the patient looks to be on good medical therapy. As you said, he's on uh, optimum dose of beta blocker, busy pro pro roll 10 milligrams, in April 10 milligrams twice daily. But he is not on mineral receptor antagonist, which is class one, recommendation and level of evidence A, and as you showed us very beautifully in your slide, that uh, mineral receptor and antagonists reduce mortality by 30% uh, in patients with heart failure. Then, as we see that the patient was not responding to treatment with enalapril and should have been replaced for sacubitril uh, uh, There is treatment for diabetes. We now no, definitely that any patient, diabetic patient with cardiovascular disease, particularly heart failure or history of heart failure, it should be on sodium glucose transport inhibitors. So thank you for this uh, very interesting case. And again, for your recommendation that uh, blood glucose in uh, patients with diabetes and heart failure should be lenient. We should aim to uh, hemoglobin A1C between 7.5 and 8%. And we know that the beneficial effects of sodium glucose transport inhibitors in patients with diabetes and heart failure is independent of their hypoglycemic effects, independent of the hemoglobin A1C achieved. So uh, I think we have uh, several questions. Let me. Uh, one question is, what is the differences between DAPA and EMPA in heart failure diabetes mellitus? Can you explain? Yes, uh, I mean, there are slight differences in terms of molecules. In terms of diabetic patients, they have a similar effect in reducing uh, uh, heart failure. But in patients with proven heart failure, today we have evidence only for dapagliflozin. So until we won't get, gather evidence with uh, um, empagliflozin, and I'm aware that the emperor, uh, emperor trial will be presented at the European Society of Cardiology Congress that will run, in any case, as a, uh, an, a digital event. But the, uh, unless we will have evidence from dapagliflozin, uh, from uh, empagliflozin, we should be using only dapagliflozin that is uh, soon to be approved by the European Medicines Agency for this indication. Okay. Another question is, do you think that patients with diabetes and heart failure should be all on sodium glucose transport inhibitors 
or the L S. I think that uh, uh, the, the question is uh, uh, not whether they should be. They, they should be that in any case, the, the, the mainstay of the treatment should be as, as GLT2 inhibitor. Then on top of that, we should add uh, whatever we feel it will be appropriate for that patient according to the glucose levels. And uh, I should say that metformin still have an important role, especially in those patients where uh, renal function is not uh, significantly reduced. And uh, But as I said, in, in, the, in, in the patients I showed you, the glycated hemoglobin was uh, very low. And that very often is a case of instability and may lead to an increased mortality and morbidity. So I just want to stress once again the fact that we have to be lenient and we should start with an SGLT2 inhibitor in our patients with heart failure, tapagliflozin at the present, but also they should be on um, uh, optimal medical therapy because those patients who take tapagliflozin on top of subacubitral valsartan have a better prognosis. Dr. Mahmoud, just a question. Uh, I know that this uh, heart failure, this session in heart failure preserve ejection fraction already we finished with uh, with FUSTO and uh, we have a question about Paragon trial and, uh, and TRESTO. Now this is a diabetes uh, with heart failure or I need your experience about the treatment of sacrovalsartan uh, and in TRESTO in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in your practice, whether diabetic or non-diabetic. Uh, do you uh, give this drug for in the beginning, uh, before using valsartan or ACE inhibitor, in, in some cases, do you use it in acute cases after uh, uh, improvement of uh, uh, of in the troops? What's your experience? And, and we need your experience as a board member of the heart failure associations huh. about of this uh, drug. Hmm. Of course, we use it according to according to the uh, guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology and hmm. the Heart Failure Association that hmm. basically say that if a patient is uh, naive on treatment, they should start on an ACE inhibitor or an, MR, uh, or, uh, an ARB only if there is intolerance. And But in patients that come and they are already on an either an ACE inhibitor or an, MR, uh, or an ARB, in, that, in that, those very patients, we have to sh switch immediately to succubitral valsart. Of course, mm -hmm. within leaving a window of 48 hours, that is always important mm -hmm. in order to avoid the effect of the secubitril and the interaction with the ACE inhibition. Regarding when to start, of course, you can start according to the different patients. I mean, if you have patients on inotropes, probably you can defer until patients are free from infusions. And But what is important is that you start prior to discharge especially in those patients who had already got uh, an episode of uh, instability whilst they were on an ACE inhibitor or on an ARP. Uh, what is the percentage of improvement of quality of life in using this drug in your, uh, in your practice? I know this is, you not have an uh, objective measures of the quality of life. I know this is the scoring system, but in, in practice, we don't use this scoring system. You feel that there's no um, improvement quality of life without in such a comparison with the improvement in ejection fraction, whether by Simpson or uh, by the, I mean, it's, uh, the improvement in quality of life it's, uh, uh, is completely dissociated from the, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, leventricular ejection fraction. You can see patients with 25% of ejection fraction who can uh, run around uh, or can uh, go on their bike, and patients with uh, 36% who have, uh, are in class three, uh, uh, three the New York Heart Association. So there's no correlation between the effect, uh, the uh, leven trigger ejection fraction and, uh, and uh, quality on quantity of exercise. Mm -hmm. The same thing is uh, you don't see an imp a dramatic improvement after hospitalization because patients gradually go through the vulnerable phase and uh, uh, often it's very difficult and uh, they may feel even worse during the first phase of uh, uh, discharge because we need to implement the different medications. Those patients where you see a very impressive uh, change in quality of life are those patients who are chronic and they get an episode of instability that may lead maybe to increase their diuretics and their 
where you switch therapy. In these patients, you see a dramatic change in quality of life. In naive patients, develop acute heart failure and all treatments without ACE or ARBs from the beginning. And then you go to, the, you decide to give them this drug uh, in one week day or uh, two weeks after, according to the different trials, you know, prove it trial and the other trial, or, or, or you continue, you start with the guideline that you have to take an ACE and ARBs after acute at stage. In naive patients, we stick with the heart failure association guidelines for mm -hmm. the time being. Okay. Uh, and I think we should all, uh, I mean, the heart failure association is the largest association heart failure worldwide. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we should try to implement the guidelines as much as possible. I think that there is space. I mean, we have a large proportion of our patients who are undertreated. Mm -hmm. So rather than going and finding patients where it's less needed, we need to to optimize therapies in patients like the one I showed you that we see in our clinic and where tre treatment is not optimized. Mm, Mahmoud, you have a Several questions uh, from yes. the audience. Yes. Yes. Sorry, huh? yes. uh, short questions, short answers, because <laughs> there are many questions. After the Virtus CV study, do you think that sodium glucose transport inhibitors are not all the same when it comes to cardiovascular protection? Uh, there is a difference uh, that for the time being. I would uh, rather wait uh, for the um, uh, publication of the Emperor. If the Emperor will show similar uh, data of the DAPHF, then uh, probably there is a class effect. If not, then the effect will uh, be just for dopagliflozin. Okay. Should glucose, sodium glucose transport inhibitors initiated early in diabetic or non diabetic patients with heart failure? I mean, when do you? introduce sodium glucose transport inhibitors in a patient with heart failure? It is very much depends on the patient profile. We have those patients where we have a very low blood pressure at discharge and where we cannot, we, we have to wait. And we have those patients that we need to unload. And in those patients, it's uh, also we need to be very careful with uh, the concurrent use of diuretics. And so we need to uh, get at least a stable dose of diuretics first. And, uh, and then start the, the SGLT2 inhibitors. And then what is important, adjust the dose of diuretics accordingly, because in some patients, the SGLT2 inhibitors may have a very profound effect on diuresis. Yeah, okay. So another question, how does interest to decrease blood sugar? Uh. Uh, that is an effect. I mean, it's, uh, it's well known that, the, um, that it's through the uh, ARB receptor, uh, the AT2, receptor there is a direct effect on uh, uh, neogluconeogenesis there is also an effect of uh, through the neprilisin uh, receptor that basically improves uh, the glucose utilization and uh, reduce the utilization of uh, uh, free fatty acids is there any uh, problem uh, from royal college of emergency medicine that they should stop sgl2 uh, when assessing COVID-19 patients, why? Uh, the, that is, uh, it, it came from uh, uh, studies that basically show that if patients are very dry, they may favor episodes of, uh, of thrombosis. Okay. And there are still, I mean, unclear data on uh, all the new uh, anti-glycemic uh, uh, anti drugs, but mm -hmm. that was the main driver. Uh, for the uh, issue of using sodium glucose transport in inhibitors in patients on insulin therapy, um, uh, yes, of course. I mean, it's uh, uh, the effect is completely independent from insulin because it, they work at the renal level and on filter on the fi filtration of uh, of glucose, and when and basically they lower the threshold for the reabsorption of glucose, so they work. And uh, uh, what we try to do in our patients is to reduce as much as possible the use of insulin, because insulin is not so friendly because it induces sodium reuptake, and therefore as, uh, any uh, means that of reducing uh, insulin will also improve, improve uh, uh, patients. Uh, the terminology of diabetic cardiomyopathy does, does exist? Oh, that is a one million uh, uh, pounds question, uh, yes. and uh, uh, it is very difficult to identify there are very few patients and uh, where you can see that uh, there's an impaired in uh, glucose uh, metabolism 
that leads to heart failure. But this is in a very minority compared to all patients with heart failure and diabetes that we see. Okay. Uh, regarding the, uh, the the SGL2 and this kind of patient, diabetic cardiomyopathy, do you think that uh, it's, it's beneficial? Uh, absolutely, because as, as I showed in my last uh, in one of my previous slides, there is a direct effect on cardiac metabolism. In those with uh, a diabetic cardiomyopathy, what is uh, the main uh, change is in on glucose metabolism with uh, uh, an excessive utilization of free fatty acids and an inhibition of the utilization of glucose. And mm -hmm. what they do, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, they block the free fatty acid utilization and they increase the uh, utilization of uh, glucose. More like... My last question to you, uh, coming back to Entresto, coming back to Entresto for the doses. Uh, uh, the guideline said if you have an ACRB on maximum dose, you should shift to a maximum dose of uh, 100 twice daily. Uh, and if not, you start by 50 uh, twice daily. What's in your practice in, in those in those titration? Uh, did it start by 50 and then 150 and then 200? And uh, every week, every two weeks, how, how can you, you manage this uh, patient with during interest? Yeah, you know, if you have a patient takes, uh, that takes uh, uh, an alapril 10 milligrams twice daily, Mm -hmm. And uh, then there's no problem. You can start with 100 milligrams twice mm -hmm. daily because there's no risk in drop of blood pressure. Of course, you see many, many patients that come with uh, 5 milligrams of ramipril uh, mm -hmm. as an overall dose. In those patients, and with a blood pressure of 104, 106. So in those patients, you don't want risk. And uh, it's better to start low and increase slowly every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Zipsia. Then uh, we have a just break, and then we have two important uh, topics. So you be with us, please. We, we awesome. need your experience, please. Thank you very, very much for this interest. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Good evening, everybody. I am uh, Dr. Mahmoud Hassanin, Professor of Cardiology from Alexandria University. My talk today is about uh, our uh, national registry of heart failure. In our uh, presentations, in our articles, we will always talk about patients from North America or patients from Europe. But we don't talk about our patient, our Egyptian patient, who is definitely different from the patients we see in North America and, and Europe. Well, this uh, registry is a part of the uh, heart. Uh, European Society of Cardiology Heart Failure Long Term Registry it was a prospective multi center observational study of patients presenting to cardiology centers in European and Mediterranean member countries of the ESC. Egypt is a full member of the European Society of Cardiology. From April 2011 to February 2014, a total of 2,145 patients with heart failure were recruited from 20 centers all over Egypt. The aim of the study of this registry was to describe the demographic and the clinical characteristics and management of patients hospitalized with acute heart failure and patients with chronic heart failure seen as outpatients in cardiology centers all over Egypt. And the second aim of the study was to compare heart failure patients from the Egyptian cohort with heart failure patients from other European countries participating in this uh, registry. And we had two international publications from uh, this registry. The first was published in the ES Heart Failure Journal in the year 2015. And here you see the investigators who participated in this study. The 20 centers were covering the whole of Egypt, the north coast of Egypt, Alexandria, Port Said, the Delta of Egypt, uh, Upper Egypt, Greater Cairo, and the Suez Canal Zone. So really it was representative, representative of uh, Egypt, all regions of Egypt. So, so uh, 1,000 
475 patients were patients who were hospitalized with heart failure, and 670 patients were chronic heart failure patients seen in the outpatient. What we, um, what we are going to present in this, uh, uh, this lecture today are patients hospitalized with heart failure. The mean age of our patients was 60 years. Body mass index, mean body mass index was 30 kilogram per square meter. And this means that our patients are obese. Mean ejection fraction was 38% and mean globin was 12 gram per deciliter. Those patients hospitalized above the age of 70 years were only 23% of our patients were above the age of 70. Females comprise 30% of the whole population of hospitalized heart failure patients. Body mass index above NAM. Body mass index uh, above 30 was present in almost 47% of patients. And ejection fraction about 45% at that time. 2015, the cut of value for preserved ejection fraction was 45, about 45 percent. So, uh, ejection fraction above 45 percent was present in 22 percent of the population. Diabetes mellitus was prevalent in 45 percent of our heart failure patients. Hypertension was present in almost 44 percent, and smoking was present in 61 percent of uh, our patients hospitalized with heart failure. The main etiology, underlying etiology of heart failure was ischemic heart disease. It was the cause of heart failure in 68% of patients. Dilated cardiomyopathy was present in almost 16%. Hypertensive heart failure, 4%. Valvular heart disease, 7.7%. Now we come to the important second part of my presentation is comparison between hospitalized heart failure patients from Egypt and other European countries in the ESC heart failure long-term registry who participated in the same study. Egyptian patients, the Egyptian court is seen in the uh, orange color and European patients in the blue color. You see that above the age of 70 years, only 23 percent of Egyptian patients were above the age of 70 compared to 60 percent of European patients. Body mass index obesity was present in almost 47 percent of our patients compared to 28 percent of European patients. Females admitted with heart failure, they were only 30 percent in our cohort compared to 39 percent in the European cohort. Preserved ejection fraction was present in 22% of our patients, but in almost 36% of European patients. And atrial fibrillation was present in only 24% of our patients compared to 48% of the European patients. It means that we had half the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in our heart failure patients compared to their European uh, counterparts. <laughs> For cardiovascular risk factors, Diabetes was more prevalent in our patients, 45% compared to 35% of the European patients. Hypertension was much more prevalent in European patients, 70% compared to almost 44% in our patients. Smoking was more prevalent among Egyptian patients. All other comorbidities like renal dysfunction, prior stroke, peripheral arterial disease were more prevalent in European patients, except for hepatic dysfunction, which was more prevalent in Egyptian patients. And we know, of course, this is because hepatitis C is endemic and uh, prevalent in Egypt. The other paper published from this registry was gender differences in Egyptian patients hospitalized with heart failure. Are female patients they're the same as male patients admitted with heart failure. Well, the mean age was the same between men and women. It was 60 years. But women with heart failure with, admitted with a higher uh, systolic blood pressure, higher admission systolic blood pressure, 
and higher resting heart rate than males. Body mass index above 30, obesity, as this is the definition of obesity, a body mass index greater than 30 kilogram per square meter. 43% of men compared to 66% of women. So obesity is quite frequent in women admitted with heart failure. Concerning etiology, there was no significant difference in etiology between both sexes. Atrial fibrillation was present in 22% of men compared to 30, almost 35% of women, and this was highly significant. So atrial fibrillation is much more common in women admitted with heart failure in our Egyptian court. Again, for uh, cardiovascular risk factors, smoking was present in 83% of males compared to almost 9% of women. Diabetes mellitus was significantly higher in women. Hypertension was also significantly higher in women compared to men. Most of our patients, whether women or men with a heart failure, had reduced ejection fraction. But look to the preserved ejection fraction. It was present in 30% of women compared to 10% of male patients admitted to heart failure. So women had more frequent heart failure with, with preserved ejection fraction compared to men admitted with heart failure. For comorbidities, or sorry, for precipitating factors of heart failure, myocardial ischemia was more frequent in men, but atrial fibrillation, uncontrolled hypertension, and anemia were more significant precipitating factors in women admitted with heart failure compared to men. For comorbidities, anemia was more common in women. And interestingly, it was more prevalent in obese women compared to non-obese women. Diabetes and hypertension were more prevalent in women, whereas renal dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction, and the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease were more frequent in men. Concerning mortality, there was no significant difference uh, between men and women concerning in-hospital mortality and one-year mortality. So to conclude, this was the first national large-scale registry of heart failure in Egypt. Heart failure in patients in Egypt have distinct demographic and the clinical features different from other European countries. Men and women afflicted with heart failure differ significantly in baseline clinical characteristics, but not in adverse outcomes. These findings highlight the value of national registries in planning primary prevention programs. And the heart failure management programs should be established all over the country to improve patient management and outcomes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tor Mahmoud. Uh... And uh, I just uh, is Foster with us and uh, just be with us. Uh, yeah. Be, um, regarding the registers, you know, this uh, this is the registry of heart failure. We have a different registry. Can you explain to uh, the audience uh, what is the importance of the registry for each country and comparing with the others? How do you get benefit of this registry and the impact in your, in your practice and your improvement of the health uh, uh, problems in, in your country? Uh, can I start with uh, uh, Gypsum and then Fusto? Yeah, well, I, did you ask me? Yes, all of you can start. You start Fusto, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think registries are fundamental to map what is the reality because we know that there is many times a discrepancy between what we see in trials, what we see in some anecdotal examples or some. Uh, uh, results that may not be the, the exactly what the reality is all about. And uh, we know in clinical trials, for instance, that many times they represent populations that may be different from our countries. So to have a good recording, a good map of what is the reality in a certain country can actually help to tailor better some of uh, um, the 
uh, treatment strategies, uh, some of uh, also to understand better uh, what, because of course you have different types of registries and, uh, and it, they, they also serve different purposes. On one hand is to understand what is the reality. On the other hand is to see how, for instance, the guidelines are being implemented. So it's very important, for instance, to understand if certain treatment strategies, certain diagnostic strategies are being properly done uh, at the national or a local level. So I do believe that registries are fundamental tools to do better patient management. And it's the only way actually that we have, even at the national level, even to show to some of the decision makers of the, 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 uh, the politicians and some of the governments and, and so on. And we do that in our country, as I know in many other countries, to show, okay, this is what the guidelines say, for instance, this is what we should be doing, and this is what we are doing. And we can only do that if we have the data. So registries are, I would say, a, a fundamental piece of work, a fundamental tool to improve uh, patient care anywhere in the world. Uh, just be. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, I have to congratulate um, uh, Professor Sanain and uh, all uh, the Egyptian uh, investigators for uh, the tremendous amount of work they put into the heart failure registry. I mean, for us, the heart failure registries are very important. And uh, uh, the amount of data we received uh, from Egypt is uh, extremely precious. And uh, as uh, uh, Fausto said, and uh, it's, uh, we, we owe Fausto a lot uh, because it was under his presidency of the ESC that the registry blossomed, and especially the long-term heart failure registry. And uh, uh, I think that the importance of the registries is what Fausto said. It's, uh, they show us how and where we have to uh, implement our therapies. And we've seen with the heart failure long-term registries, from one to two, how the highlighting, the fact that many patients were not receiving the optimal medical therapy, then translated into a better treatment six or five years later, with uh, many patients adhering to ACE inhibitors and uh, uh, beta blockers. And uh, now we will have the third wave. And with the third wave, we aim to show that the new treatments will be in implemented. But also, as also Fausto mentioned, is the importance uh, of the differences between the different regions and uh, that should guide uh, the different governments and uh, the different uh, policymakers in taking uh, the appropriate uh, decisions on how to fund that specific uh, uh, area. And because, if, for example, uh, our failure is uh, uh, very much underfunded uh, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, restrictions are put on drugs, but the expenses on drugs is only 7.5% of the overall expense of the cost for patients with heart failure. So if we see data like uh, the ones that you have in Egypt with a large prevalence of diabetes, that is a very well and a very good way of showing government where investments in heart failure should be done. Dr. Sophie, I have a question for yeah. both our speakers, Professor uh, Pinto and Professor Rosano. Are you uh, surprised by <clears throat> the differences in demographics between Egyptian patients admitted to heart failure and their European counterparts? And again, the differences between men and women uh, admitted with heart failure in our registry? That was the question for me to you. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to ask. <laughs> but I mean, there no. were, we, we have seen great differences. Are, are these differences a surprise to you or they are expected? Well, we know demographics, they, 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 they do have an impact on the, or they should, on the, on the results. So I think, again, this is very important data because it can actually help you to see where you have to target more specifically or with more, I would say, with, uh, with, with more strength. Um, it seems that you have some, uh, in terms of demographics, you have here some areas like, you know, the, the percentage of obesity, the, the gender imbalance, if you will. Um, so there are some things, the, the, the age, it's also interesting to see the, the, the age differences, um, the diabetic uh, um, issue. I, I think what it shows here is that there are some significant differences that may help you uh, 
in a way to um, to tailor better um, the the some of uh, some of these results because basically you should be targeting uh, diabetes, you should be targeting uh, over uh, overweight, uh, obesity. So there are many things here that probably will help you to try to identify programs that can help you to minimize the impact of heart failure in your in your population. But there's a lot to do with the, with the specific. Um, demographics in uh, in your country. That will be my my uh, interpretation. We know also that registries. There are some, of course, some limitations on the registries because it depends very much on. And uh, you know, uh, you you. I'm sure you you know better uh, the characteristics of this uh, um, where this data is coming from. In terms of you know, if 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 you're going into a region or if you targeting more um, patients have been admitted. Or patients, you know, it depends very much on the profile of the patient, also the result of, of a survey or a, a registry. And that's what needs to be acknowledged is the kind of sampling, because basically a registry in this case is, is a sample. So you need to analyze also how this sample was obtained so it can better fit with the, um, with the results. But I think it's very interesting data and certainly with, I'm sure it will help you to uh, uh, also to target better some of these targets in uh, uh, in your country. And congratulations also for uh, this. Thank you. It's very important. Professor Rugano, yeah. Yes. No, I think that the data fit with the uh, gradients that we see from Northeast Europe to South, uh, uh, from, uh, from Northwest to Southeast. And uh, that is something that uh, uh, we constantly see an increase in the risk of, uh, uh, of diabetes an increase uh, in uh, the BMI. And uh, uh, I was a little bit uh, surprised about the association of female sex with the uh, with obesity. But, you know, it's uh, differences, as uh, Fausto, Fausto said, uh, they are not just uh, representing a different burden of the disease, but also how the, the population is structured and what is the, what are the prevalent risk factors within the specific, uh, uh, the specific population. And we know that, uh, I mean, uh, I am originally from the south of Italy, where most of our women tend to have uh, the same characteristics of women in Egypt, and uh, where the uh, prob possibly the uh, epidemiology is similar, which is different from uh, uh, the north of Italy, and it's completely sim different from the one, the, the one I see here in, uh, in the UK. So it's uh, uh, basically they reflect the population, the habits of the population, and the baseline risk factors of the population. Uh, I have a question to just be again. I'm sorry, this is not to uh, legacy, but I have two, three questions the same for uh, belonging to, to your uh, lecture, please, because you have to finish this. I wonder these questions. Can SGL2 replace standard of care, AS or ARBs or ARNI? Because you're already concentrated uh, diabetes, are based on them. Uh, absolutely, absolutely not. They are. Uh, oh. They can be. They should be used uh, together. They should be used together because uh, uh, tapagliflozin has, show, uh, has shown an, uh, an effect on top of uh, me, uh, of oh, yeah. medical maximum medical therapy. We have to so they are not them. alternative. We should pursue always uh, an, uh, a RASI blockade and okay. a big blockade. Uh, Mahmoud, the, the cutoff of your ejection fraction, you have a preserved, you have mid-range, you have a reduced, or you have only both uh, preserved and reduced? Uh, in the first, in the first uh, uh, paper, it was in 2015, we had uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction mm. and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The cutoff value was 45% ejection mm. fraction. Mm. In the recent paper, 2018, we used the recent European guidelines of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction below 40 percent, mid range between 40 and 49, and uh, preserved ejection fraction 50 or above. So okay. you found more atrial fibrillation in the second piece? Yeah. Because no. I have here doubled between Europe and Egypt and Egypt. Yes, the prevalence so of atrial fibrillation in our Egyptian yeah. patients is half that in the European patients. I know. I don't know because why. Because of two, two main reasons. First. Uh, the prevalence of hypertension is higher in uh, the European uh, patients, and they are much more elderly. And so we right. expect atrial fibrillation to be much more frequent in European patients than in our uh, okay. much younger patients hmm. uh, with less prevalence of hypertension. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Mahmoud. I think we have uh, the last uh, talk. We have a break just for Dr. Mohammed Slim is waiting. Uh, Mataz, uh, is Dr. Slim with us? Finally, after the three important lectures, two by uh, international speakers, Professor Fusto, Professor Jospi, and then Professor Hassanin in the Egyptian side, uh, uh, Registry of Heart Failure, and then a second Egyptian guy, which is a, a famous uh, speaker in, in Egypt, uh, the consultant cardiology National Heart Institute and secretary of uh, intervention uh, working group, Dr. Uh, Mohammed, Professor Dr. Mohammed Skrim, is going to speak about the essential intervention. Welcome, Dr. Mohammed. But uh, thank you, Dr. Sophie. I'm really happy to share this uh, very outstanding meeting, sharing with the international uh, figures and speakers with Professor Sophie and Professor uh, Hassani. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, my uh, my talk will run in the context of the meeting. Uh, of course, in the heart failure management, we have cornerstone. Uh, therapies that changed the morbidity and mortality of patients with heart failure. Starting in 1987, by the first introduction of enalapril, uh, which showed in the consensus trial the favorable effect on the mortality in patients with congestive heart failure, and uh, nine years after the first introduction of beta blocker carbidilol in U.S. carbidilol heart failure study, then followed in uh, uh, in uh, 1999, by the RAILS study using spironolactone to improve the morbidity and mortality in patients with heart failure, and lastly in 2001 with the impressive results of Valsartan in heart failure, which has been shown in the Valhert trial. <laughs> and despite all these current therapies that improve significantly survival in heart failure patients versus placebo, mortality in HEFREF heart failure with reduced ejection fraction remains high. You can see the figures here, the reduction in uh, uh, mortality in ACE, ARPS, beta blocker, MRA, ranging between 16 to 34%. But still, we have uh, within uh, five years of diagnosis, the mortality of heart failure patients uh, approaching 50%. That exceeds most of the cancer mortality except for lung cancer. And sudden death can occur in heart failure patients without worsening of symptoms. 40% will eventually die with sudden cardiac death. In addition to this uh, very high uh, rate of mortality, we have the recurrent hospital admission of a patient with heart failure, uh, which is considered to be the primary cause of hospitalization in Western countries in the patient's age more than 65 years of age. And with each hospitalization and discharge, the patient's mortality is increasing. And we can uh, demonstrate that about 44% of patients will be re-hospitalized at least once in their time course of heart failure. And for all these reasons, patients with heart failure has a very bad quality of life. Almost 76% of patients with heart failure struggle to perform their daily activities. Almost more than 60% of them reported symptoms that are consistent with depression or at least depressive symptoms. And 40% of patients struggle to socialize or engage in a social family with their relatives, with their friends and families. So the burden of heart failure is huge. And there is a big gap or big room for improvements in both quality of life in most and mortality. So new therapies are needed that can more fully address uh, factors responsible for the underlying progressive cardiac function, functions. And in 2014, the introduction of the first army, Sacubitril Valsartan, or the Entristo. And this has been shown uh, very uh, clearly in the Paradigm Heart Failure Study, which uh, was the first study uh, to demonstrate the benefit of this important uh, new therapy in heart failure. As you know that uh, Sacubitril, Valsartan, or Entristo is a novel salt complex, the first in class, angiotensin receptor inhibitor or ARM. Uh, 
you know that there is some neurohumoral uh, mechanisms or pathways that are activated in heart failure, and their activation will lead to deleterious effects uh, and will affect the clinical condition of the patients, which are mainly the sympathetic nervous system and the rest uh, system or renin and eutensin aldosterone system. We have another uh, uh, pathway in which there is a release uh, from the myocardial cells, from the endothelium, from many other cells, the uh, 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 neutral endotypes, which are very favorable uh, peptides that will mediate vasodilatation, decrease in blood pressure, decrease in sympathetic tone, increasing sodium and water excretion, decreasing vasopressin and aldosterone, and on long term, they can reduce the fibrosis and hypertrophy. However, the half-life in plasma for these peptides are very short due to uh, inhibition or degradation by the enzyme neprilysin. So if we can inhibit this neprilysin, we can increase the concentration and half-life of these neutral endopeptides that will mediate all these favorable effects in patients with heart failure. And to complement the blockage of the bad pathway, because neprilysin is also responsible for the degradation of the angiotensin 2. So by inhibiting this neprilysin, we have a potential increase in the angiotensin 2. By co-administrating the Valsar 10, we can also inhibit this increase in the angiotensin 2 by inhibiting the AT1 receptor by Valsar 10. So by addition of secubitrin Valsar 10, we have a complementary effect on the inhibition of this deleterious or bad pathway. And all of us know the astonishing results of the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, which, in which more than 8,000 of patients with chronic heart failure, NEHA class 2 to 4, with HEFREF ejection fraction was less than 40%, and, was, uh, and also with elevated NMT, pro-PNP, or BNP. And there was a very significant reduction of uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, composite of cardiovascular mortality or first hospitalization, 20% risk uh, reduction of sudden cardiac death, together with 16 risk uh, reduction of death from any cause, total mortality reduction, and if you are hospital uh, admission for heart failure by 23% and 18% if you were stays in the intensive care, and this was very statistically significant in comparison to one of the cornerstones in the treatment heart failure, which is the enalapril. In most of the previous trials, all therapies has been compared, have been compared with placebo. But here in the paradigm, this new agent or interest has been compared with enalapril with these very impressive uh, favorable results. And also, we can uh, see very clearly that treatment with interest to improves quality of life, including heart failure symptoms and physical limitation, as measured by one of the important, reliable, and reproducible uh, parameter, uh, which is the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. Not only the, the improvement in this score, but the persistence of improvement all through the study uh, uh, duration. While here in April patients, which showed initial improvement, then gradually declined to uh, reach to bad quality of life, while in interest to we see here the curve improved and became sustained all through uh, since the time uh, from randomization. And the improvement uh, of all these physical and social activities uh, in patients with HEF, uh, REF were significantly improved uh, and including all these activities with largest responses in household chores, which are the regular duties of the patients and sexual relationships. And these all uh, reflected by improvement in uh, the quality of life, more decrease in the rate of depression and more social involvement of the patients. And for all these impressive results of the paradigm, the army or interest who has been uh, come to the guidelines of heart failure, whether American or European, as the American guidelines uh, state that or recommend uh, interest to uh, or ACE or ARPS for patients with half ref uh, and recommend interest to in conjunction with the evidence based beta blockers and the MRA in patients with chronic symptomatic half ref, NEHA plus two or three, who tolerate ACE inhibitor or ARP. The European guidelines 
putting in Fristo after use of rest blockade, and if the patient is still symptomatic, we can switch to uh, uh, the Infristo. And in my presentation, I will show you how these recommendations changed to come for the Infristo to be a first line therapy. Of course, we have two pathways uh, or journey in patients with heart failure. Those uh, the here to the left is the journey of patients with acute decompensated heart, uh, heart failure, acute decompensated heart failure with admission to the ICU and then discharge coming to be a chronic ambulatory patient and starting the medication here. And of course, the time covering the patients here in this ambulatory setting and excluding all patients with acute decompensated heart failure. For the first time, this important uh, trial, uh, transition trial, in which initiation of interest uh, was used in hospitalized patients with HFF after hemodynamic stabilization, and we will see the primary results of this important study. The primary and secondary endpoints of this study was to demonstrate the percentage of patients uh, after hemodynamic stability of acute decompensated heart failure, and we evaluate the number at 10 weeks and see the percentage of patients which can tolerate uh, the dosage of the interest to at the end uh, of these 10 weeks. And we can see that initiation of secondary treatments are then in a wide range of HFR patients early after acute decompensated heart failure event in hospital or shortly after discharge was feasible and overall well tolerated as by the end of the 10th week uh, in patients post discharge, they can tolerate uh, or achieve and maintain any dose of secretive valsartan for at least two weeks. And uh, in here, uh, we can see that around 50% of patients can reach to the target of 200 milligrams after 10 weeks of discharge. The second trial is the pioneer heart failure, which was the comparison of Entristo versus Enelapril on the effect of the level of NP propane P in patients stabilized from an acute heart failure episode. And we can see very significant decline of NT pro PNP in interest to patients versus in a with a very significant almost 29% more reduction in the level of NT pro PNP in patients with secretary valsar 10, and this was statistically significant. Also, this was associated with about 46% relative risk reduction. Uh, in serious clinical uh, composite endpoints of uh, mortality, heart failure, rehospitalization, use of left ventricular assisted device, and listing of patients as end stage for heart transplantation. And so we can see after transition and pioneer heart failure study that the cycle is completed and uh, interest to can be used uh, in acutely confronted heart failure uh, shortly after or before discharge of the patients after hemodynamic stabilization. But what about the use of Entristo in newly diagnosed heart failure patients? If we will come here to analyze the number of de novo heart failure patients here, in transition, it's almost one third of patients with de novo heart failure and 24% of patients were naive to the use of resplocate. In pioneer heart failure study, almost 35% were de novo heart failure patients and more than 50% of patients were uh, naive to ACE inhibitors. And we will see improved heart failure uh, trial, uh, which examined the correlation between the natriuretic peptides and the remodeling of the LD by Entristo. Almost 15% uh, of patients were naive to RAS blockade. Some study of the transition uh, uh, study in patients with de novo HFRAF found that. Uh, that the patients with de novo heart failure are more likely to achieve and maintain target dose of secretaryl valsartan by week 10 compared to those with prior heart failure. So we can uh, start uh, uh, interest to and should be considered as first line therapy in de novo patients hemodynamically stabilized after an attack of acutely compensated heart failure. In pioneer heart failure study, we can see in patients who are uh, naive to RAS blockade, there is a significant decline of the NT pro PNP compared to those patients uh, which were using uh, ACE inhibitors or ARBs uh, 
before uh, and not naive to the use of rust blockers, we can see here more than 60% reduction of mt protein p in naive patients compared with only 46% uh, decline in the interest group in patients using previously RAS blockade. And also, the incidence of cardiac, uh, cardiovascular deaths and hospitalization was uh, starting earlier in patients naive to RAS blockers in comparison to those using RAS blockers before, which uh, started uh, almost after one month compared to, to the other group. So we conclude that in patients admitted with a primary diagnosis of acute decompensative heart failure, and irrespective of previous use of rest blockade or exposure, interest to safe and well tolerated when compared to conventional RAS antagonists in hospital initiation of army resulted in greater reduction in NT propyNP and reduction on rehospitalization for blood pressure. We have a very uh, trial, uh, which, which is the proof heart failure uh, trial, in which the uh, uh, we will see the correlation between the decline of NT prop EMP and the second improvement together with improvement in the ventricular remodeling. And we can see here by using these five parameters the left ventricular ejection fraction, the left ventricular and the historic volume index, and systolic index, and left atrial volume index, and also the diastolic function as measured by the E over the E prime, we can find here very significant improvement. Uh, and it was a uh, very statistically significant deep value in those patients with improvement of all these parameters in correlation with the reduction of NT pro PMP in patients taking interest. And subgroup analysis uh, of patients with new onset heart failure, with naive ACE or ARPS, with um, natriuretic peptides less than the level involved in the paradigm inclusion criteria, and even in patients not reaching to the target dose except for the diastolic functions here, all showed significant improvement in patients taking interest. According to all these impressive results, in May 2019, the clinical practice update on heart failure uh, uh, recommending uh, that uh, the, regarding interest to initiation of interest to rather than an AC hip or ARP may be considered for patients hospitalized with new onset heart failure or decompensated congestive heart failure to reduce the short Relatively setting still the recommendation is the same for health care patients. Also, the interest to have a very complementary program uh, involving all uh, uh, types of patients, all types of heart failure. Recently, in the last ECC, we had the results of Paragon heart failure trial, and although it was negative in patients with F, but it showed that we may again gain some benefit in some uh, category of patients like female and with lower ejection fraction. And we are waiting the results of the Paradise MI, uh, MI trial to evaluate the efficacy and safety of interest to on morbidity and mortality compared with Ramitrel following acute MI. So we can say that interest to is not only a drug, it is very essential heart failure intervention which can reduce significantly the mortality and hospitalization. Now, the last part of my talk is how to use interest to. First of all, we have to stop uh, ACE inhibitor in patients taking them for at least 36 hours before using interest to. Uh, we can use in most of the patients uh, 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 100 milligram twice daily as a starting dose. In those patients who were on moderate to high dose of ACE inhibitor or ARBs like antisartan from 8 to 60 milligrams, Remitel 5 milligrams, Balsartan 80 to 160, in all these patients we can start by 100 milligram twice daily. We can start by reducing dose 50 milligram twice daily in the following four types of patients. Patients not currently taking rest blockade, naive to taking uh, any rest blockade, and in patients 
uh, previously taking low dose of these agents like Valsartan, not more than 50, uh, 40 milligram, Ramipril 1.5 milligram, can be Sartan less than 8 milligrams. The third type of patients with renal impairment, uh, when the GFR uh, is uh, less than 30 ml per minute, and the patients with moderate hepatic impairment, I have to start here by 50 milligram and after treating gradually over two to four weeks to reach to 100 milligram and ultimately to the target dose, dose of 200 milligram twice day. If we are, I will come to my final conclu conclusion, I can say that new therapies for heart failure are needed that can more fully address factors responsible for the underlying progressive cardiac dysfunction and will cover all the compensatory mechanisms that can lead to deterioration of the condition. In 2016, ACCHA, a heart failure society of America and the ACC guidelines recommend ARMI for the treatment of FRF. Simultaneous inhibition of nephrolysin and suppression of the RAS with sacupetrine versa 10 has complementary effects and uh, will improve the results. And this to significantly reduce death from cardiovascular cause, first hospitalization for heart failure, all cause mortality, and also improving significantly the uh, patient's quality of life. The new uh, Heart Failure Association consensus convey a positive message for interest to in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as uh, uh, being used in patients with uh, first time or de novo heart failure and with uh, recommended for the first time in patients uh, shortly after hospitalization with hemodynamic stabilization. And thank you for your attention. <coughs> thank you very much, Dr. Salim, uh, for this wonderful uh, lecture regarding the, uh, the interest. To can, uh, if you allow me just to, to summarize what you said, because you have a, uh, uh, yeah, all of trials, and uh, it's, it's a paradigm the starting point, yes. reducing mortality and then improving quality of life, reducing hospitalization. Then come the acute stage for two studies, transition pioneer. Transition after uh, uh, complete relief of the acute stage will uh, pioneer four to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And then comes L, 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 uh, newly diagnosed, the sub-study of this. And then the, you take you number know, 30% of this, you, you, you said that uh, according to this uh, consensus said a newly diagnosed should be taking a layer consensus. And then a layer last trial to prove heart failure, the remodeling. Yani, the remodeling. Exactly. Uh, that's right. That that all, all you, you said. The recommend, your recommendation for all heart failure should be taken. But center you put an important slide at the end of here, the recommendation, the very, very practical slide, mocking to, to leave it at the end. Yani. You have to stop this inhibitor 36 hours. We have a can small dose of ACRBs. You continue the same dose. Our full dose, you yeah, take the full dose like uh, the, of the Entresto. If naive, you should start with a small dose. Oh, that, this is the summary of what you have. The precautions uh, of this uh, in, uh, drug. El, el, el blood pressure, for example. El, el, uh, are you doing mass blood pressure me measure? Uh, if you serum potassium, EG, for what you, yani, el, el important tips and tricks. For, for taking this drug, yeah. if you a patient uh, taking this drug and develop hypertension, for example, you the yeah. the dose, uh, we make it once or you, uh, uh, can we have with us, Dr. Uh, Gijespo as well, and Dr. Uh, Pusto, please, can you join us? Okay, so Dr. Steve, can you answer these questions? Yes, uh, of course, very important practical question, Dr. Sofi, and we are depending on three parameters to start and after a treat interest. First, the systolic blood pressure, the second is the serum potassium, and the third of the GFR. As the systolic blood pressure is above 100 millimeter mercury, and as the serum potassium is normal in the range of 4 to 4.5, and the GFR is above 30, we can start safely by 50 milligram or 100 milligrams, according to uh, what I said to start which dose of that. And at each time I have to go up to up rate, I have to recheck again the potassium level and the kidney functions. And if the patients cannot tolerate the upitration of the dose, I can extend the use of the lower dose for one week more, and then I, I can start to re uh, Again, also one of the tips, I can reduce the dose of diuretics, for example, I can reduce the doses of other patients to allow for uh, better upitration of the dose of interest. Dr. Juspi, regarding the transition, pioneer heart failure, and the sub-study of the newly diagnosed uh, patient. What's your opinion about this? Uh, 
uh, two trials and sub study yeah. for the consensus of the European heart failure. Yeah. Yeah, the, basically they show that you can uh, safely uh, initiate an uptight rate uh, drugs after the acute event. And that is important because it's uh, if we get patients with um, uh, an acute decompensation that are ready on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, that means that we can safely start the uh, circuitral valsartan according uh, to uh, the dose that uh, Dr. Slim uh, just showed us. Uh, there's another trial, Dr. Slim, uh, I just mentioned about the proof heart failure, about the cardiac remodeling. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, the first lecture of Dr. Uh, uh, Fusto regarding the remodeling uh, issue, the ventricular remodeling, is how to measure it. And you also uh, mentioned this. Do you think this trial is an important to have an, uh, a way to measure uh, the improvement in function because the patient sometimes you notice that is improving the quality of life and symptoms without objective measures in 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 treatment. Uh, I mean, this ejection fraction doesn't change significantly, and we are not depending on pro PMP. So, what's your advice? Uh, uh, the question to just and then Dr. Salim. Hmm. I think that the, if the patient feels better, there's no need to recheck the echo because also because we know that there is a. Um, uh, uh, an inter-observer, an intra-observer variability, and therefore, if we're going to we'll see a four to ten percent, a four to six, eight percent difference, we don't know whether that is within the uh, variability index. So uh, we have uh, clear evidence that the uh, treatment reduces uh, uh, mortality and morbidity. Uh, mm -hmm. If the patient feels uh, even better, it's uh, uh, is good. So we shouldn't be. Uh, changing our practice and how to assess and follow our patients. And we shouldn't be too reliant on uh, uh, repeating, uh, re repeating uh, uh, diagnostic tests that often are not needed. So basically, we apply a drug that reduces mortality and morbidity. And if the patient feels better, it's even better. But if I may Do say something. Have any comments? Uh, just just yes. a very short comment, yeah. um, but I think it's um, uh, it's of, of course we rely very much on the on the clinical symptoms and the, on the clinical condition of the patient. But it's also very important, and that's why these studies we saw that in some other studies, and the, uh, the, the proof it here also shows to demonstrate the correlation between, uh, for instance, uh, reverse remodeling and the match with a, 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 a better clinical outcome or better clinical response. So I think it's also important even um, uh, just at the level of the, the trial to demonstrate this correlation between what is observed clinically and what sort of substrate, if you will, um, hap is, is happening. And that can be shown by using some of these methodologies, like for instance, either by ECHO or by uh, CMR to demonstrate this reverse remodeling, which again, it does uh, provide some objective information that can help us to understand better the pathophysiology and the mechanism uh, underlying. So I, I agree with uh, with Giuseppe that you may not have to do it all the time, but at least from a conceptual standpoint, it's important to uh, to have that sort of confirmation, and uh, and I think that's an added value of having. Uh, this imaging uh, methodologies to help you to, to, to show that and to understand better what is the reaction uh, in terms of, in this case, reverse remodeling and the match with the clinical improvement. No, no I, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Fausto. I mean, my comment was just on how to follow patients, and uh, sure. uh, uh, but of, of course, we, whenever we have uh, new treatments, it's always important to parallel what we see in terms of uh, clinical benefit with the mechanistic. So it's, uh, uh, it's of pivotal importance. Mm. Uh, um, whether we should then we repeat many, many tests in patients, uh, especially in uh, areas where uh, can be different uh, difficulties, uh, even getting to have an, uh, uh, an echocardiogram done, then it, uh, it is a question that should be adapted to the, to the local uh, practices. Sure. Uh, regarding the, they have a question about pro PMP. Uh, is it you know to diagnose heart failure? It's clinically, or in some cases you do pro NTP or pro MP. Would you think this we need this for uh, uh, uptight rating or this? Is, so you're showing the prognosis.
not only the patient, not the echo. We, have, we don't have a biomarkers uh, for improvement apart from some symptoms, just symptoms. You don't believe in echo in some cases. Do you think this could be the pro -BMP? Um, I mean, it's uh, basically what we say in the guidelines is that you should use the uh, biomarkers to BNP and pro-BNP to exclude uh, the possibility of ischemia, so to rule out the possibility of uh, heart failure, but not just to make a diagnosis or to guide uh, uh, treatment. So it's, uh, 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 of course, we know that in population as a prognostic value, but what is the prognostic value within the same patient? That is an, a different issue. Of mm. course, if I see a patient that comes with uh, 4,000 and uh, of BNP and then goes down to 1,000 when I discharge it, I'm more confident of mm. that patient that came in with 3,000 and I discharge with 2,500. But of mm. course, uh, that doesn't mean that over long term they have uh, in the say in uh, the say within the same patient. Uh, an importance. The data that we have on prognosis, they came, they they come mostly uh, from from population in uh, from population studies. A uh, question here from the audience: What about the lowest blood pressure to start interest to? And what happened when the blood pressure became lower down in heart failure patient? What you are going to do? Decrease the dose, stop the drug, stop the diuretics. What do you think? Stop beta blocker and go for interest to? <laughs> it's uh, tips and tricks. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think we have good evidence in heart failure that often we give drugs that reduce blood pressure and at the end we see an increase in blood pressure. And uh, there's a very import important analysis from Paradigm from John McMurray that basically showed that patients that, uh, even patients with low blood pressure that started and Tresso showed uh, uh, a slightly improvement in, uh, in blood pressure. So uh, I think we should adapt. And of course, uh, we should adapt to the underlying condition, because if uh, uh, I will be okay uh, in reducing uh, or in uh, forcing the titration in a patient with 104 uh, of uh, systolic uh, without a significant ischemia uh, is different issue in a patient with a significant coronary stenosis where, or diffuse coronary stenosis, where probably wouldn't be confident to go below uh, one, 115, 120. So you see the differences and uh, we have to apply uh, co clinical judgment. We cannot put everything in one box. Dr. Mahmoud, oh. any comment or uh, question? Yes, I mean, uh, <clears throat> when I see a patient with low blood pressure, I have to look for drugs which lower the blood pressure. For example, we use excessive dose of diuretics, which will lead to hypovolemia. And so the patient will not tolerate RAS inhibitors or, uh, or interest to sometimes on nitrates and other drugs which lower the blood pressure. But I think that <clears throat> patients with heart failure can tolerate a low blood pressure down to perhaps 100 or even lower than 100. And the patient is asymptomatic. Uh, in this case, I will continue my uh, medications. Yeah, the, the one hmm. yeah. Yeah, go on, go just then. Yeah, the one thing we said in the uh, in the guidelines, in the 2016 guidelines of the ESC is that it's uh, um, Entresto can be also um, uh, combined uh, with uh, with Avabradin. And the reason we said that is that in many patients, we, we know that the heart rate is important and uh, uh, maybe even reducing the dose of a beta blocker and increasing and or introducing also Avabradin to control heart rate if they are in sinus rhythm may help uh, the possibility of using uh, Entresto. And uh, so that you should use it as an enabler, as also you use it as an enabler, what the new potassium blockers in all those patients where there is an increase in potassium. So you see, it, it's, uh, uh, we have to learn how to use other drugs that have a neutral effect on blood pressure in order to optimize and to uh, favor the use of uh, uh, drugs like interesting. So and now we have from, from yeah. potassium, uh, we do have now pateromir, which, uh, as you know, there are some ongoing uh, studies uh, exactly to to help us to probably uh, um, optimize uh, medical treatment uh, in some of these patients where we are afraid of uh, uh, increasing the level of potassium. But just a comment on the, what you were discussing about low, uh, blood pressure, low blood pressure. Um, I think it's, it varies a lot, and we, we all treat a lot of these patients, and uh, we can see the same blood pressure and different reactions in different patients. So I, I think we have to use clinical judgment, as you mentioned, uh, 
and, uh, and, and use the individual patient as his or her own control. I see patients sometimes with 90, 95 who are perfectly well and some with 105 who are already dizzy or with the... So it's, it's a little bit uh, the kind of individualized uh, approach and uh, do the app titration carefully as was mentioned in the, uh, in the presentation and using the patient as his own control, let's put it this way, but, and use a uh, good clinical judgment. Because again, it's not only the number, but it's the way that the, the person deals with that number or the number translates the clinical meaning. And, and, and I think that's fundamental when we're doing clinical practice. And, and, and here the guidelines, they are what they are. You know, they guide you, but uh, you have to use your good clinical judgment to, um, to do the, make the right decision for that specific patient. I think we, we come to the, have to come to the end. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, for me, it is a wonderful webinar. Uh, uh, we to have uh, two international speakers, Dr. Fusto Pinto and Dr. Jusper Rosana, and have two uh, Egyptian uh, international as well uh, speakers, Professor Mahmoud Hassanin and Professor Mohamed Selim. Uh, on behalf of CVREP, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, uh, I'd like to thank Novars who sponsored this, uh, this uh, webinars and ICOM for technical support and preparation. And uh, now that the second wave will be 18th of June. Uh, the second wave of heart failure webinar. Remember this. You know the number of attendees this day? Uh, can you count this today? Is 436 attendees till now, from the beginning to and a half hours, which is a very big number. The first webinar to have this number, I think. Uh, to, so I have two, a lot of webinars in the last two months, but for me, this is the biggest webinars to have, not from Egypt, it's from all over the Middle East. Already I have questions from the, all the Middle East, and thank you very much for. Uh, for uh, attending this uh, webinar, and I hope uh, to uh, to finish uh, this pandemic as soon as possible and see you in person. Uh, have a good night. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Fausto. Bye. 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 Bye.